He was actually present there and saw his prophecy come true. This is what he had been warning the people in verse 15 of chapter 19. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to bring on this city and all its towns the entire calamity that I have declared against it, because they have stiffened their necks so as not to heed my words. He had been prophesying the coming judgment against Jerusalem, and sure enough, it happened just as he prophesied. But the point I want you to key in on it, in on is why. They had stiffened their necks against God and His Word. You see, the judgment did not come apart from numerous warnings prior to. The judgment did not come without ample opportunity to repent prior to. The judgment did not come without any notice And yet, even with all of the opportunities that God afforded for the people, the great majority of the nation refused to repent. They stiffened their necks, which is just a, an expression to mean they stubbornly, doggedly refused to seize the opportunity to turn back to the Lord and instead continued their sinful foolish ways, even in the face of warning after warning after warning, until finally God's judgment came. That, beloved, can be transferred to what we're talking about in the book of Revelation. And we'll see that on display again this morning as we continue through this great book. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to come into your house and to study your word. I pray over the next few minutes, God, that you will Use me simply as a mouthpiece to speak to all of us here, myself included. Lord, with the words that you would have for us today. Lord, that we might hear your voice, that we might recognize it, that we might be transformed by it. That we might encounter your presence here today and go out of here strengthened and encouraged and blessed for having been with God in this place today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Being seated, you can turn back to Revelation chapter 9, where we will continue through our series in Revelation this morning. Revelation chapter 9. Last week we covered the first half of the book, the fifth trumpet, and today we are going to look at the latter half of the book in a message simply called the sixth trumpet. By my count, this is the 13th message now in our series this year through the book of Revelation. It's a fascinating book. It's a book that uh, many, many people are very intrigued by. And, uh, and so I have enjoyed this series and look forward to that. And it remains. As I look at my outline, my, my list of sermons, that at least I have planned, unless God somehow alters or changes my plan, uh, there'll be just a few, maybe 31, 32 sermons in the series, which will take us right up to Christmas time, which means right now we're about a third of the way through it, and uh, continuing to progress right now through the portion of Revelation, which is about the tribulation, which is the majority of the book, from chapters 6 to 19, roughly. Specifically, we are talking now about the seven trumpets, and today we are on the sixth of these seven trumpets. Now, you don't have an outline, but if you are taking notes out there, you can just write the first point this morning. It's called the four angels. The four angels. And we'll begin in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded... And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the day and the hour and the month the year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. The 
John has laid out for us. We are there sharing his eyes and his vantage point, if you will, in the heavenly throne room, which we have discussed and described. And we saw a couple of sermons ago that seven angels, perhaps archangels, we don't know, but seven angels came out and stood before the throne of God there in the heavenly throne room. And each one of them was given a trumpet. And we've watched now in the last couple of chapters as each one of them has successively blown their trumpet, bringing forth yet another judgment upon the earth. And this week now we see John there describing what happens when he hears and sees the sixth angel blow his trumpet. John says in these verses that we just read that he hears a voice. He heard a voice that came up from among the four horns of the golden altar which was before God's throne. Now we've seen this altar before already in the book of Revelation. If you remember the first mention of it was when John saw the martyrs who were underneath the altar crying out for justice. Not long after that, we saw during the seventh seal, which preceded the trumpet judgments, the seal judgments, an angel come forward to this altar with pans of incense, which represented the prayers of the saints, and if you remember, uh, cast those down towards the earth. And so this altar that we're talking about appears to be, consistently throughout the book of Revelation, more of an altar of incense than it is what we would consider an altar for animal sacrifice. If you remember the temple there in the tabernacle before that, there were two different altars on the outside of the, of the temple proper. There on the outside was the brazen altar where the priest would... Uh, slaughter and offer sacrificial uh, animals to the Lord. Inside the temple was a golden altar, among other things. And that golden altar was used to burn incense to the Lord as a perpetual uh, offering to Him. This appears to be a, a golden altar of incense that we see in the heavenly throne room. And He hears a voice coming from this altar from amongst the four horns. Now, if we remember the description of these altars, there was a there was a horn on each corner that, that came up. And so he hears this voice radiating or emanating from the altar. And the voice says in verse 14 to the angel who had the trumpet, release four other angels who are bound on the great river Euphrates. So the angel with the trumpet is instructed by this voice to release four additional angels. Most commentators, and, and I would readily agree, suspect that this is the voice of God. It's an authoritative voice. It's a voice that's telling the angel what to do and he does it. There's no reason to believe this is not God giving an instruction to the angel. And when the angel receives his instruction... He is uh, to release these four additional angels. Now, what about the Euphrates River where these other angels are, are said to be? The Euphrates River, if you know your geography, is a long river. It's actually the longest river in the Middle East. It's 1,740 miles long, according to what I find on the Internet. It's one of the most prominent and important bodies of water in that part of the world. The 
foundation of the Garden of Eden and the waters that flow through the Garden of Eden. And most biblical scholars, I guess you would say, place the Garden of Eden somewhere along the Euphrates River or in that, in that area. Another important mention of the Euphrates River is found in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. And I'm actually going to go there, but perhaps you remember this from last year. Last year we studied the patriarchs in a series we called The Chosen Church. And the first patriarch, the, the, the forefather of the patriarchs, if you will, the, the first one is Abraham. And when God made a covenant with Abraham, he included the Euphrates River as part of it. Chapter 15, verse 18 of Genesis, it says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, as far as the river of Egypt, to the great river, which is the river Euphrates. And so... Although the nation of Israel has never achieved that lofty expanse, typically when we think of Israel, we think of the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River and a little tiny sliver of land in between. But in God's eyes, he gave Abraham and his descendants, that would be the people of Israel, from the Euphrates River all the way to the river of Egypt, which... Many commentators say that would be the Nile River. That, that's a pretty wide expanse. So from God's perspective, Israel has much more land than what they've ever actually re, uh, realized. But that's important throughout the book of Revelation because when it talks about crossing the Euphrates River, it means that they're going into the land of God's people. These four angels are bound at the Euphrates River. The fact that they are bound suggests that they are likely fallen angels, which that means demons. They were bound there. If they were just regular angels, there would be no reason to bind them there until this moment. Another reason why we think they might be fallen angels or demons is because look at what their job is. To kill a third of mankind. That seems like a, a, a destructive demonic activity as opposed to something that a righteous angel of God would, would do. They had been prepared in advance specifically for this moment. Makes that clear in verse 15. And so with the command of God, these bound fallen angels were released to kill one-third of mankind. By the way, that one-third fraction harkens us back to the first four trumpet judgments. you remember those? They're called the one-third judgments. First trumpet was a third of the earth and its vegetation was burned up. Second trumpet, one-third of the, the salt waters and the seas was, was turned to blood. Our third trumpet, one third of the fresh waters, lakes, and springs was made bitter. Fourth trumpet, one third of the suns, moons, and stars are, are darkened. Now we get to the sixth trumpet and we see one third of mankind is slated to be killed by these angels and the army that they lead. Did you notice in verse 16? It said that these four angels are somehow associated with this massive army of 200 million horsemen. Perhaps these four angels at the Euphrates were maybe the, the, the leaders or the commanders of, of four various branches of this massive army. We don't know, but somehow the two, two are connected in this trumpet judgment. Now just for perspective, let me give you just a, a comparison. China is the largest nation on the earth. We, we know that. They have more people than, than the United States by a, by a 
lot. Right now, the army of China, which is the largest army in the world military, numbers at about 2.5 million soldiers. 2.5 million. That's a lot. But even that is nothing compared to 200 million. You would have to have 80, 80, 80, 80 of China's armies of 2.5 million to equal this army of the six trumpet, 200 million. This is a huge number. And John hears this great number and he sees this just extensive, massive, beyond our imagination army there on the earth. Well, the second point this morning, if you're taking notes, is called the demonic army. And we're going to talk more about this massive army that John saw. Let's continue in verse 17. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat upon them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and of hyacinth and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. And out of their mouth proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses, horse is in its mouth and in the tail. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. So after giving us the number of this great army, now John begins to describe this great army that he sees. Now first of all, I would just say that again, he is going to use figurative language. We usually want to interpret Scripture literally, but when it's obviously figurative, then we have to interpret it that way. And when he's using words, it looked like this, or it looked like that, then that is giving us clues that he's not being exactly literal. He's using the vocabulary he has to try to explain something that he doesn't have a word for. And so as we begin to look, first of all, he sees these, this, this army as horses and riders. He sees it as what we might call the, the cavalry. Okay? And he begins to describe first the riders of these horses. And he says the riders have breastplates, which would be like, I don't know, uniforms or shields on their chest, which were the color of fire or hyacinth. Or brimstone. Now, just for our sake, hyacinth is is the same word as sapphire. And so we're familiar with what a sapphire is. A sapphire is, is bluish in color. It's a beautiful gemstone. I love sapphires and emeralds. I think those are prettier than diamonds, but that's just me. Sapphires. It says brimstone. Brimstone is basically a burning stone. Most rocks we know don't burn. They get really hot, but they don't burn. But there are minerals out there that do burn. And so brimstone is usually defined as sulfur. Sulfur will burn. And so if that's the case, these riders have breastplates of the colors of red, blue, yellow. He's trying to describe these riders, and then he moves into the horses upon which they are riding. And it says they have heads like lions. That doesn't mean they are lions, but he's doing the best he can to describe it. They have heads like lions, and from their mouths come fire and smoke and brimstone. And as instructed, these riders and these horses go out and proceed to kill one-third of mankind with the fire and the smoke and the brimstone that proceeds from their mouth. Now we also 
has the tails of these horses as being serpent-like with heads. Obviously, he is being figurative in his speaking. Just like, by the way, he was in the earlier part of chapter 9 when he was describing the locusts, is the word he used, that came up out of the pit. And he gave them a very, very graphic and very uh, image-driven explanation. And now he's using similar language to describe these horses and their riders. Let's take a moment just to consider the extent of the damage that will be done here. Earlier during the tribulation, maybe you recall, I believe it was back in chapter 6 when we started this discussion of the tribulation portion of the book of Revelation, we looked at the first four seals which represented or were, were, uh, were uh, described with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The, first, the fourth one of those, the fourth seal, the fourth horseman, if you recall, he was given the command to kill one-fourth of mankind. Now, here we are a few chapters later, and we see this immense army of 200 billion led by these four fallen angels who are now sent out to kill a third of Earth's remaining population. So let's consider this example. We'll do a little math this morning. Imagine, if you will, that we start with 100 people. It's a nice round number. If we were to, heaven forbid, kill one-fourth of them, or one-fourth of them were to die, that would be 25, right? That would leave 75 people. Now then, if we come along and we kill one-third of the remaining 75 people, again, that is 25. And that leaves us with 50 people remaining. So between the two different judgments, if you will, we've started with 100, and now we're down to 50. That is half. Well, even though the numbers will be much larger and more inflated, the ratio will work out exactly the same. So between the fourth seal and now the sixth trumpet, Half of the world's population from the beginning of the seven-year tribulation to this point will be killed by just these two judgments alone. Not to mention the deaths and fatalities that occur as a result of all of the other judgments that are simply not quantified in Scripture, so we don't know how many. This is a, a, a staggering number of ca uh, casualties to consider. One in every two people dead by this point. Likely more than that, if we include the other judgments. And we're still not done. As far as the identity of these horsemen, let's think about that for a minute. There are many commentators out there who identify these horsemen as modern day soldiers. They, they identify this description as very rudimentary description of maybe modern war equipment and modern soldiers. You know, some, some young people, but maybe even some older people, I don't know, Play games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Or if you look on, on the news, sometimes you'll see a modern SWAT team that's decked out in, I mean, they, they, they look pretty formidable to me. Modern equipment, modern technology. There are some that say John is trying to describe using ancient words a, a, a modern army that's just massive. That could be the case. However, there are others who lean a different direction, and I tend to agree with them, because when you consider 
description he gave in the previous judgment, which we talked about being demons from the pit of Tartarus, that is the hell for angels who have come up out of the pit and been released on the earth. To me, I tend to lean with the school of commentators who believe these to be demons. This is a demonic army. These riders are demonic. They're not human at all. Now, let me suggest another interesting possibility, because the truth is we really just don't know for sure. But perhaps the sixth trumpet, which we're discussing today, this massive army that's going to kill a third of mankind, perhaps it is related to and connected to, and perhaps even the continuation of the fifth trumpet. Last week we talked about the fifth trumpet, as I just mentioned, in which the, the pit was opened. We believe that pit, or many believe that pit, I believe that pit, to refer to Tartarus, the, the uh, holding place, the combining place, the hell, if you will, for many fallen angels. Suppose that these angels came out and they tormented the earth for five minutes, for five months, stinging people with their tails, like we talked about last time in the fifth trumpet, and now when the sixth trumpet blows, these four angels are released to organize this demonic horde into an organized military, so as then now under God's permission to now go out and actually kill one-third of the population. So perhaps there's some continuity between the two. Another possibility 
oftentimes because of their misguided and erroneous response to the Lord and to the circumstances of life, they will begin down and, and go down a rocky road of rebellion and waywardness and backsliddenness that takes them far, far, far from God. In stubborn resistance, they will refuse to repent of their sinful attitudes and actions. Instead, they become increasingly hostile and increasingly entrenched against the Lord. Now, I know that none of you have ever done anything like this, so I'm going to just confess on my behalf. But there have been times when I've done something wrong, and I've been called out on it, and rather than admitting it, I double down on it and dig my hole even deeper and become increasingly entrenched in my faulty and foolish position. Now, I know y'all don't do that, but I've done that in the past, I'll admit. Sometimes there are people who give an opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. They won't. They just keep getting digging their hole deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and to the point that they look up and they couldn't get out even if they wanted to. Right? Some of these folks even stop believing in the Lord altogether. Which, by the way, it's another sermon, but if they stop believing in Him altogether, then really they never truly believed in Him to begin with. But that's a sermon for another day. Now let me consider the other group of people. Non-believers. Non-believers are blinded by their sin to the point that they don't even recognize God's handiwork at all. They don't see the activity of God that goes on every single day in this world all around them. They don't recognize God's judgment or discipline when it comes. And by the way, not everything that bad happens that happens bad is is God's discipline. Some of us just unfortunately the the consequences of sin. And most of the bad things that happen in our life aren't even necessarily the direct result of our own sin. They're the indirect result of humanity's sin. But the reality is that people who are non-believers don't recognize the handiwork of God in the events that unfold around them. They don't understand or receive why he would send or allow certain things to happen. They don't understand his redemptive purposes. They don't understand his compassion. And according to their worldview, they don't acknowledge the Lord at all. And so they really don't understand why things happen. They just do, just randomly, or perhaps just as a natural process. Of, of life. And so non believers see no need for repentance. And so when we look at verse 21 and 20, we see both people. We see those who surely recognize this judgment as, as an act of God, but they just stubbornly refuse to repent, just like the children of Israel did years ago, just like we often do even today. Or they fall in the category of non believers. And they don't recognize God's presence at all. Either way, knowingly or unknowingly, they continue to practice their same behavior. Like, like little children, they continue. 
cares about our life. He wants us to value life. He wants us to protect life. He wants us to make good, sound choices about our physical life. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to make uh, uh, choices that uh, uh, would not wreck be recklessly endangering our life or the lives of others. Yes, our physical lives are important, and the Bible has a lot to say about that, and it tells us that we should pray for the, our physical needs. Yes, all of those things do have their place, but the Bible also says this world is not our own. That we are strangers and pilgrims passing through. In fact, the Bible says the, our life here is like a vapor that just appears for a moment and passes away. When we consider the short amount of time that we will spend on this earth, even if we live to be 110 years, the short amount of time that we spend on this earth compared to eternity, it is a brief, fleeting moment. In fact, it's not even worth comparing. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, my present sufferings are not even worth comparing to the eternal blessings and riches that I will enjoy in glory. It's not even a comparison. And therefore, God knowing this, and God seeing things from a higher plane than we see them, and with a greater perspective than we understand them, God knows that the condition of our present earthly temporal circumstances is minuscule compared to our eternal destiny. And that, therefore, God will readily allow trials, tribulations, sufferings to occur in this life if there's any opportunity that through those things, temporal things, physical things, somebody, somebody might make an eternal choice that will affect their destiny forever. So important that we grasp that. God readily allows difficult trials and tests in this life as a means to spur us and others, perhaps, on towards repentance, so that we might come to know, or that they might come to know, and forever enjoy the riches and blessings of the life to come. Yeah. Because the life to come, and I am being literal, the life to come is literally, infinitely more important than our physical comfort. Infinitely. And the reason I say all this is to say, when we read about Revelation, or other passages in the Bible that talk about judgment, and God's discipline, and hardship, and difficulty, and suffering on people's lives, oftentimes, especially in the sermon after sermon after sermon, which we're going to see over the course of the next few months, it's easy to let our minds get twisted and us start thinking to ourselves, God is wrathful, vengeful, angry, bitter, mean God. God is a just God, yes. But God is a loving God who has given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity even to the very end for people to be saved. And if it takes the suffering of this person over here to bring about the salvation of another person over there. So be it. In God's providence, I can't question it. He's sovereign and I'm not. And so don't allow these judgments to poison your thinking about God. He disciplines because He loves. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. As we study Revelation, it's a, it's a challenging book. It's a hard book. To read these judgments.
judgments and to keep in our minds that you are loving and long-suffering and compassionate. The fact of the matter is, God, there are people who no matter what you do, they will not repent. They will rebel and they are deserving of your judgment. My prayer is for those who would receive you. God, that their minds would be open, that their hearts would be open, that conviction would come so that they might come to know you as Lord and Savior. Either through the ministry of this church or another church in town, it doesn't matter who. I'm, I'm not into that. I don't care who gets the credit. It's all for Jesus. I just pray, Lord, for the salvation of souls before it's eternally too late. Help us, Lord, as your people, to be the salt and the light that we're called to be so that lost people might be saved, perhaps through our testimony and the power of Jesus Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name.